are. Um, so for our final presentation on this panel, we have Jacqueline Jackie Young um, is a professor director of undergraduate study in the Department of History of Art at Yale University. Uh, she specializes in the art and architecture of medieval Europe with a focus on Gothic architecture and sculpture, but her undergraduate teaching has come to take on a wider perspective, encompassing sacred buildings and allied arts and many living and historic religious traditions, including Greek and Roman antiquity. Um, she's published two books, um, the most recent being Eloquent Bodies, Movement, Expression, and the Human Figure in Gothic Sculpture from Yale University Press, which won some awards. Uh, and Jacqueline, Jackie, after you. Thank you so much. This is such a thrill. And I'm only sad that this is going to be over after this weekend. I've been so, so looking forward to this conference. Thank you for having me. So in fall 2018, a Mongolian band calling themselves the Who, spelled H-U, burst into global consciousness via YouTube with videos for their songs, Yuva Yuva Yu and Wolf Totem. By April 2019, Wolf Totem had reached number one on the Billboard Hot Rock, Hard Rock Digital Song Chart. Uh, and you can see uh, here how many videos these, uh, how many views these videos have gotten as of last week. The band embarked on an epic tour of Europe and North America in fall 2019 in support of their new album, The Gehrig, um, whose cover uh, design is behind me. Um, and in fall 2021, as soon as the world opened back up to travel, they were back on the road. And it was a day after seeing them in New Haven in September that I sent a frantic proposal to Jeremy and Charlotte um, asking to participate in this event. The Who are returning to the States this spring, and I urge you all to check them out if they're coming through your town, they're awesome. Now, despite speak, singing only in Mongolian and speaking minimal English to the crowds, The Who is an incredibly outward looking band. They did not develop their following by toiling away in sweaty local clubs. Uh, although many Mongolian metal bands are doing that right now. And I've posted a link to a new, uh, very recent article uh, on them. Uh, but rather they use the internet to crash into the global scene. And they seem to tour mostly in Europe and the US. But all of this came after years of musical training and historical study on the part of the band members. Jaya, who along with throat singing, plays a reed harp and jaw harp, a reed flute and jaw harp. Uh, Gala and Enkush, who both throat sing and play the Morin Kor, or horsehead fiddle. And Temka, a sound engineer and com composer of film scores, who plays the tovshur, or lute. Uh, and they're, they're, they also, um, the, the creation of this band also stemmed from the vision of a genial producer uh, called B. Dashdondog, known familiarly as Dashka. The guys met and were brought together by Dashka at the Mongolian State Conservatory in Ulaanbaatar, where they were mastering traditional forms of singing and instrumental technique, skills that Jaya and Enkush had learned as children in rural uh, nomadic families. And while they were already listening to the Western metal that had come into Mongolia from the early 1990s after the fall of the Soviet Union when these guys were all kids, but Dashka was uh, older, uh, it was only in 2016 that Dashka brought them together to create this form of powerful metal infused music that they would call Hunu rock. Now the Hunu or Zhongnu were an ancient people, actually a confederation of various tribes who dominated the Eastern range of the Central Asian steppe lands from the third century BC into the second century CE. So long before there was any Mongolian language or identity to speak of. Artifacts in an early Hunu burial site um, inspired the Hu's logo which features not a dragon, which would associate them with China, but a stylized snow leopard. Their graphic designer posits this as the true sacred symbol of the ancient Mongolian tribes. Uh, you see here the design that includes the full name Hunu, uh, and then the core letters, uh, which you see on, on much of their merch, uh, which themselves are shaped to, to, uh, to look like blades. 
The band's archaizing statement of purpose, which appears twice in the liner notes to the CD of the Gehrig, uh, once, as you can see on the right, associated with uh, this producer, Dashka, harkens back to an unnamed ancestral they under the golden snow leopard totem and the sharp blade of the great Modun Khan, eternal as the sun, bright as the moon. Now, Modun Khan was the leader of the Hunu people from 209 to 174 BCE. And it was he who first succeeded, it seems, in consolidating power in the area by conquering uh, tribal rivals in the north, but this was uh, not a long-lived um, empire. The statement then jumps us forward in time to they, under the nine base banners of the great Chinggis Khan, who gathered the nations, the great nations under one rule. Now, Chinggis Khan, the oceanic or universal emperor, was born around the year 1160, so the European Middle Ages, but antiquity uh, for the Mongols. And he was given the name Temujin, or blacksmith, after an enemy from a neighboring people, the Tatars, who his father had slain. Legends tell that the infant was born clutching in his right hand a clot of blood the size of a knuckle bone which predicted his glorious uh, future and really couldn't hardly be more of like a metal, <laughs> a metal origin. The rise of Temujin from a child of an undistinguished tribe of nomads, one of many in the steppe lands and mountains of Central Asia, to being declared emperor in a council of tribal leaders in 1206, and then leading his people through a massive territorial expansion through to his death in 1227, this is prime fodder for the metal imagination. You see on this map, the yellow lines that indicate Chinggis Khan's campaigns and the orange ones, those of his, um, his successors uh, through to the end of the 13th century. Um, this book, The Secret History of the Mongols, a chronicle composed shortly after the Khan's death for his closest family and friends, accords in certain respects with accounts by horrified locals who witnessed or heard of the Mongols' incursions into China, Syria, and Afghanistan, and Eastern Europe. People like the Englishman Matthew Paris, writing in 1241, uh, who were sure that this horde of detestable satanic people who showed up all of a sudden um, were satanic beings escaped from Tartarus itself. Um, and the very rogues who Alexander the Great had walled up behind the Caspian Mountains. Their reputation for cannibalism was a constant trope, which they likely encouraged as part of their psychological um, terror campaign. The growth of the Mongol Empire into the largest contiguous land empire in human history was due to a combination of relentless violence, destruction, plunder, and terror with a very fine-tuned organizational and administrative apparatus, extensive communication systems, and lifelong military training programs that made their equestrian warriors basically become one with their animals. And I posted a modern demonstration of Mongolian mobile archery on my Google Drive document. This is a super fascinating story. And if you're not familiar with it, um, I recommend this cheesily titled but very good book by Jack Weatherford from 2004. Now the Who's lyrics, seem to have been written by Dashka and the band. There, there are no specific credits given, but they're made to sound like they come from ancient epics. They're all sung in Mongolian and then translated into English in the CD's liner notes. The album's title, The Gareg itself, um, refers to the diplomatic passports introduced by Chinggis Khan used to give people safe passage through the vast uh, Mongol uh, lands. And four of the nine songs on this album make explicit reference to Chinggis Khan. The title song, Wolf Totem, ends with a call to him. Um, the song, The Great Chinggis Khan, which is on our Spotify playlist, uh, and You Wa You Wa You. The other songs are all archaizing in different ways. Some recount animal lore, um, like the legend of Mother Swan. Uh, they sing the praises of, of women and mothers uh, more generally, you know, a, a real departure from typical um, metal uh, approaches. Uh, they exalt the heroic warriors of past generations and nomadic life and nature um, on the steps. One song, the same, ventures into philosophy and religion, reminding us of the ecumenical approach the historical Mongols took to the many religious cultures they encountered. 
And UAUAU, despite its call for the revival of the Khanate, criticizes people who are born in ancestors' fate yet are sleeping deeply, blindly declaring that only Mongols are the best. Now, it's not entirely clear what this means on an album that is so Mongol-centric. Though it's true that the historical Mongol success and empire building came not just from their military prowess, but also from their recognition and retention of the accomplishments of the people they conquered. Their expansion depended on local spies and translators, scribes, metal workers, scientists and doctors, and others whose lives they spared amid all the chaos. And when Mongol administrators took up residence in the towns their armies had captured, they didn't do the Roman thing of reshaping the place into their own image, but rather accepted and even um, often embraced the local norms. The who, by fusing traditional and Western sounds, zeroes in on this interplay of the particular and the universal and the ancient or medieval and modern. Nowhere is this expressed more elegantly than in their video for Wolf Totem. Released in fall 2018, here we're looking out over this beautiful view over, over the steplands, uh, here the opening shot of their video, uh, which situates uh, us above a broad valley uh, whose silence is broken only by a wolf's howl. Taking up a lower standpoint, we see a tall banner appear from the crest of the hill as an armored horseman approaches. As he swiveled his, swivels his horse around, we see the, bat, the totem's ribbons flutter and we hear a bird call and the horse whinny. The man raises his banner aloft and suddenly we're thrust up close to gloved hands grasping the handles of a motorcycle. And we pull back to watch a group of burly leather clad men drive slowly across the plain. Our view switches then to the front and we see that the bikers are following the horsemen. And it's then that we hear the, str the strings of a lute struck, introducing the deep steady rhythm of a single drum pierced by the higher pitch sound of Gala's Morin core, which he's bowing next to a fire. The music's energy picks up as our view shifts back and forth between the approaching bikers and the individual musicians. And then suddenly we're right up close to the face of Gala, who is growling in this strange guttural voice. Now you don't need the captions to know that this is a badass war chant. It takes the form of a call and response with the bikers who stand behind the four band members chanting along and nodding their heads. When Temka comes in with his tov shur, you know that things are about to get heavy and they do with a full on drum set and bass kicking in a more conventional hard rock sound. Now, although the scene remains the same throughout the remaining four minutes of the song, it stays really riveting. The music is spare and there's nearly no melody to the vocal line, yet the sound of the instruments together, the propulsiveness of the rhythm, the thickness of the timbre, the otherworldly force of Gala's throat singing give the song a really irresistible energy. And the effect is even more powerful in live performance. I'll show you quickly. Uh, Sorry, I won't continue watching this all day, although I could. Um, the, in the recordings, their instrumentation, instrumentation is not really metal in a conventional sense. Like there are no distorted guitars um, in, the, in the CD, but in the performance, they really um, have this kind of uh, grungy, loud, affective uh, power. Their look too is very, um, um, you know, very uh, sort of conventionally metal, although it fuses metal uh, appearance tropes with traditional Mongolian dress. They're very, very carefully crafted. I posted a couple of other live performances in my Google Doc. But back to Wolf Totem. By beginning with that juxtaposition of the Mongol horseman and his motorcycle troops, uh, the video sets up and then collapses a dichotomy between ancient and modern. The bikers, while certainly reflecting the fact that many modern rural Mongolians use motorcycles to get around, also introduce a global element. 
North American audiences and probably beyond will get the association between these tough looking Mongolian bikers and Mongols MC, the notorious motorcycle club who since the 1960s have harnessed the reputation of Chinggis Khan to proclaim their own fierceness. Here the Mongolian troop represents the progeny of the ancient nomadic equestrian warriors, um, but also the modern and the global. The band members, by contrast, come into relief as embodiments of the historical, giving voice and sound uh, and appearance to the ancestors. The gravelly throat singing that you hear in all the Who's songs employs a continuous deep drone that a skilled singer can then overlay with higher pitched overtones, like an upper voice singing along with them. Um, they can have uh, sing different melodies over the drone uh, and even like really sharp um, high pitched whistling sounds. And I've linked to two videos uh, on my Google doc in which Jaya and Gala perform various techniques of throat singing solo before their who days, it's amazing. Um, throat singing itself seems to be very ancient. Its commonality to widely dispersed nomadic pastoralists in Central Asia and elsewhere has led ethnomusicologists to posit, posit its origins very early, um, around the time of the Hunu or before. As Theodore Levin's fascinating study of living throat singers and other indigenous musicians in the region has shown, this technique developed not as a performance mode, but as a private form of expression. Specialists might throat sing to encourage a mare to nurse an orphan foal uh, or to keep their, uh, their goat herds together. Um, they might throat sing to give honor to the guardian spirit of a stream or to communicate to other people the shape and ambiance of a particular mountain in what Levin calls oral mimesis, which is completely fascinating, uh, or to relate stories of the ancestors to one another. In these cases, as in metal, melody is much less important than timbre. The overall sound effects mesh together. Wooden flutes and jaw harps, such as Jaya plays in several Who songs, also enable traditional musicians to create distinctive soundscapes produced by breath passing through the instrument or fingers creating vibrations by plucking a bit of metal. These instruments enliven the shape of the space around them. The Morin Kor or horsehead fiddles that Gala and Enkush play are custom built versions of traditional instruments that are typically played seated like cellos as you see them in this um, sort of unplugged performance also linked on my document. Medieval European travelers reported that stringed instruments were vital components of the Mongol courts. Prior to the People's Revolution in 1921, which made Mongolia into a Soviet satellite, many rural people had simple boxy or gourd shaped fiddles hanging in their gears or tents, which they'd play for visitors or neighbors. But these fiddles with carved animal heads aren't documented, documented very early, not before the 19th century. Now this is important since the horse head fiddle takes center stage in so much of the Who's visual iconography, which uh, as here. Um, the brightly painted carvings they have on these instruments are a big part of their medievalizing and some may say self-orientalizing flair. Gala here is sitting in front of a famous painting from 1963, which presents such an instrument as an age old tradition. Although people did play the horsehead fiddle during the communist era, it became a really central motif in Mongolian national self-fashioning only since the Soviet Union's collapse, as I learned from um, Peter Marsh's very, very niche and very interesting book. In 1992, to celebrate Mongolia's new independence, there was a big state ceremony in which a newly made instrument called a Turin Concor, or so state sovereign fiddle, modeled on the one in this painting was ceremonially enshrined in the government palace by presidential decree. This fetishization of the horsehead fiddle is part of a larger political and cultural movement in Mongolia to reclaim their country's pre-revolutionary past. It wasn't only Western pop culture, including rock music that the Soviets suppressed during their long reign, but also the Mongolians history and culture the nomadic pastoral way of life that the Soviets saw as backwater and primitive and embarrassing. 
The current historicizing movement has led, among other things, to the revival of shamanism. The ancestors are returning in force to demand the honors that were repressed for most of the 20th century. And it's led to a new interest in the golden age of Mongolian glory under Chinggis Khan. In the picture for their new tour poster, the guys are hamming it up in front of this colossal monument to the emperor near the capital of Ulaanbaatar, which was just built in, 20, uh, in 2008. What a worse tribute to a proudly nomadic person who never had a solid home and did not want anyone to know where he was buried than a 40 meter high statue on a huge architectural pedestal. It's really bonkers. But what more appropriate tribute to this culture than to flood the world with immaterial, transient, portable, yet extremely powerful and viscerally absorbing music that uses words, sounds, visuals, and instrumentation to harken back to a specific Mongolian past. A past that in many respects resonates, I think, more strongly with the metal imaginary than really with any other form of Western expressive culture. The Who is not a metal band with a Mongolian spin. They're a Mongolian band that recognizes metal to be the best vehicle for projecting an idealized vision of their pre-modern past. To return to the Who's mission statement in conclusion, after invoking the ancestors under Modun Khan and Chinggis Khan, the statement turns us to the present and outward to the global. We crafted this music by honoring the thousands of years of the true legendary history of warriors. Be heard now in every nation and every tongue, wherever the sun rises. Thank you all for your attention, I'm done. <laughs>